Okay, welcome to the first installment of what I'm calling the Keen Stream. That's right. Hi, I'm Brian Keen. For those of you who don't know, um, earlier this year when I ended the horror show with Brian Keen, I said that I would begin regularly live streaming at some point. Um, and while I've done a couple live streams since then, they were in uh, relation to my position with the Scares That Care charity. Uh, I wanted to actually start live streaming on the channel, you know, content for me. And uh, tonight we're going to do that. We're going to kick it off with a Richard Lehman Christmas. That's what I'm calling it. It's a Richard Lehman Christmas special. Uh, coming up later in the stream, uh, I will be, jo uh, be joined uh, by a number of authors. I'll get to them here in a moment. Uh, coming up on future live streams, and people are saying, how often do you intend to do this, Brian? I don't know. Um, it's not writing, so writing is always going to come first. Um, but I'm guessing twice a month, at the very least once a month. Uh, but probably more likely twice a month. Uh, so in January, you'll see one or two of these live streams. Uh, coming up on future live streams, our guests will include David J. Scow, Cynthia Paleo, Tim Wagoner, Gabino Iglesias, and many, many more. Um, and hey, if you folks like this Richard Lehman Christmas special, maybe we'll do some more shows based around the holidays. We can do an Edward Lee Arbor Day or a, a James Herbert Valentine's Day special or something like that. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, chime off in the comments on the stream. I will try to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, just let us know you're here if you have a, a question for myself or for any of our guests, ask uh, related to that probably a much better chance of it can read on the air. Uh, later in the stream, as I mentioned, I will be joined by Jonathan Jans, Christine Morgan, Jeff Cooper, Wesley Southard, and Wild E. Young. In fact, Christine is hanging out backstage right now. Uh, they're going to discuss their own favorite Richard Lehman novels and how his work has inspired them. But before we get to that, I'd like to start off by showing you some Richard Lehman rarities from my personal collection, starting with this shirt, this shirt that I'm wearing. That's right. Uh, this shirt that I'm wearing once belonged to Richard Lehman himself. Uh, in fact, if you go through convention pictures from back in the day, uh, you will sometimes see him wearing this shirt. I don't know how well it's showing up on the stream, but it is a lovely shade of purple. Um, when he passed away, uh, his wife, Anne, gave this shirt to me after his memorial service, um, along with this coffee mug that I have here on my desk. This is one of Richard Lehman's coffee mugs, uh, one of a kind item. The great man himself drank coffee from this mug. Uh, I do not drink coffee from the mug because I don't want to, you know, contribute to its deterioration. So it sits up here on top of the desk and it holds pencils and mementos from my youngest son and and things that are special to me, as is the mug. Um, some other super rarities from Richard Lehman. We have this Richard Lehman Christmas card. Let me hold it up there. Uh, it says, and all through the houses, not a creature stirring. Guess what? When you open it up, get why? Well, where's my? That's an authentic uh, Richard and Kelly Lehman right there. Richard Lehman Christmas special would not be complete without a handmade Richard Lehman Christmas card. Um, also, a rarity. Uh, this is a, a postcard Dick Lehman sent me from uh, the Poe Museum. Um, he and his wife Anne had spent a weekend at my house back in 2000. Uh, it says, "Hi, Brian." Uh, thanks for the loan of the book. You know, to this day, I don't remember what book I loaned them. <laughs> uh, enjoyed it a lot. And thanks again for producing such a great time at KeenCon 2000. It was fabulous. I haven't laughed so much in, well, since the Denver gross-up. Um, 
what he's talking about here was a party at my house that we dubbed KeenCon. This is back in 2000. Uh, I just published a book. In fact, it just went live on Amazon today. It's called Sympathy for the Devil. Now, this book originally came out in 2004. Um, it was my very first nonfiction collection. There are a lot of stories about Richard Lehman in there because a lot of that book was written when Richard Lehman was still alive. Uh, and the complete story of Keen Con 2000 and uh, everything that happened there uh, is recounted in that book. We're going to circle back around to that in a moment. Um, other other rarities. Let's see. What else do we have here on the pile? What I did is I went into my library, which is in a room behind me. Uh, this room that you see here is my office. And then down the hall, at the very end of the hall, is Mary San Giovanni's office. And in between the two of those is our massive library. So what I did is I went into the library. And I didn't pull out every Richard Lehman novel I have because this would be a 12-hour live stream. What I did is I tried to pull out some rarities that maybe not everybody has seen or knows about. Um, things like this, The Lawman. Now, Brian, you say, that's written by Lee Davis Willoughby. Why is that on the Richard Lehman Christmas special? Well, this was uh, something that Dick wrote under a pseudonym. Now, this entire series of books, you know, it was, it was back in the days of what they called men's adventure. That was the actual name of the genre. Um, things like Deathlands, maybe some of you remember that or Mac Bolin, or Doc Savage. Uh, and uh, The Lawman was uh, the Western equivalent of that. There were hundreds and hundreds of these published, uh, always under a house pseudonym. Dick Lehman wrote uh, this particular episode, uh, this particular one. Um, excuse me, I misspoke. The Making of America was the name of the series. The Lawman was the title of of this particular episode. Uh, I don't know how hard this is to find anymore. I know it used to be incredibly hard to find a copy of this, especially in good condition. Um, I don't know if people still know he wrote that or not. Another pseudonym he wrote, used was uh, Richard Kelly. This is Tread Softly. Uh, many of you probably have read it as Dark Mountain. It was eventually republished as Dark Mountain under his name, Richard Lehman. Um, the reason he used that pseudonym is quite a long story. Uh, it has to do with the, the sales failure of the woods or dark. That is recounted in detail and a writer going to get to a writer's tale at some point in the stream. Um, other rarities that many of you may not have seen. These are called fastbacks. Let me, I'm still figuring out where the webcam is. This is the return this is Halloween Hunt. I have a bunch of these. I just I grabbed two, two of my favorites to, to show you. Um, now, these were basically short stories that are published in these little mini paperback chapbook format. And what they are, uh, it's it's they're educational readers. Um, it's for adults who maybe had never learned how to read and were learning to read for the first time, or uh, for folks who came to this country and English was not their first language. And, you know, they were learning to read and speak English and they did all kinds of genres. They did mysteries. They did crime stuff. They did spy thrillers, science fiction, a lot of horror. Uh, and Richard Lehman wrote a lot of those. Um, from what I understand, it paid very well for, you know, again, what I said was essentially a short story. And then the authors who wrote these, including Dick could turn around and resell those short stories later on to other markets. Um, so it's a very cool thing. Um, of course, speaking of chapbooks, here's some some rare layman chapbooks. Uh, this is In the Attic, published by Camelot Books. Um, two here from Gauntlet, The Keeper, and Tell Me a Tale. And like I said, I didn't get out every rarity. I just, I got a few things that I knew people would like to see, like the shirt, and the mug and the Christmas card and, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, not all layman fans know exists, uh, like the lawman, for example. Um, he also ghost wrote a romance novel. It's one of the few layman novels I do not have. I've been unable to find it. 
Um, I, I found a copy a few years ago, but the front cover was stripped off. Didn't want that in my collection. Um, but speaking of short stories, let's get into my favorite layman novels. Then we're going to have our guests on. They're going to talk about their favorite layman novels. We're going to answer your questions. Um, my first favorite layman book is actually not a novel. It's a short story collection. Uh, this is A Good Secret Place, published by Deadline Press. Um, you know, Layman has, what, at least a half dozen short story collections. Uh, this is my favorite um, of them all. Why? I don't know, just because every story in this one is a winner for me. And also, I, I love this edition. I love all of their titles. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they put out some really cool books back in the day. So a good secret place on my list of favorite layman's. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? The Quake. Um, or Quake, as it's also been published. Now, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go ahead and skip to a writer's tale. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Quake. Uh, Dick Layman says in a writer's tale, the idea for Quake came to me in the wake of the Whittier Shaker that occurred on October 1st, 1987. At that time, I was still employed at the law offices of Hughes and Crandall. This was during the period of writing Funland. Due to the nature of my work, I was allowed to keep very unusual hours. Monday through Friday, I got up every morning at 4.30, drove through the dark streets from my home in West Los Angeles to the law offices in Glendale, about 30 miles away, and started work about 5 a.m. I'd do my eight hours and leave the office at 1.30 to 2.00. With this schedule, I was able to avoid most of L.A.'s nightmarish traffic congestion. Plus, I got home early enough to work on my novel for a couple hours every afternoon. Because of my great but oddball schedule, I was completely alone in the law offices at 7.45 a.m. when the earthquake struck. I was on the second floor of the building, and the epicenter was in Whittier, quite nearby. I thought the building was about to come down. With the floor rolling like a stormy ocean, or so it seemed, I ran through the office and down the stairway and made it outside at about the time the quake ended. My only concern then was getting home to Ann and Kelly. Now, he goes on to write about it for quite a while, but that's the part I wanted to share. Uh, as a writer, I'm always fascinated with where fellow writers get their ideas. And as most of you know, I am never above mining real life for fiction. Uh, and that's exactly what Dick Lehman did with Quake, another one of my faves. Um, and another one of my faves, Flesh. This is just great. It's a, it's a parasite novel. Uh, this snake-like little monster, he burrows in under your skin, and he gets up here in your spinal column, attaches himself to the stem of your brain, and then he can make you do all kinds of sick, sadistic shit if you haven't read Flesh, you should. It's a lot of fun. Um, the Stake. I'm a sucker for novels where the writer is the protagonist. Uh, the Stake is is uh, one such novel. Larry Dunbar, uh, which you know Dick is on record as saying was you know his Mary Sue, for lack of a better term. It, it, it was him, uh, based on him. Uh, Larry Dunbar is the protagonist in this novel. A writer and his friends fight a vampire. Um, if you've read my novel, Dark Hollow, this was an influence on it. I know everybody talks about Machin and the Great God Pan, etc. They don't see the stake's influence, and that's unfortunate because, uh, yeah, the stake totally, totally influenced Dark Hollow. Um, three more, and then we're going to start bringing in our guests. One Rainy Night. Uh, just ultra violent, ultra fun, ultra fast paced. Um, without spoilers, there's a murder, and then this weird rain falls over the town, and people turn into homicidal maniacs. If that sounds like sort of like my novel, The Complex, yeah, again, Richard Lehman inspired a lot of what a, a lot of what I do. Uh, I brought up a writer's tale earlier, hands down, this is my favorite Lehman book. Again, it's not a novel. Uh, I think it is the best book on writing ever written. Uh, I think it's utterly essential if you're a layman fan, a layman devotee, but even if you don't care for the man's work, 
Um, it, it is an essential seminal read uh, if you want to write for a living because, because this is the Bible right here. This is the Holy Grail. It tells you how. Um, now, I know that the estate is confirmed that this will be coming back into print at some point, and that's great. I don't know when that is, uh, but if you see a pop a copy pop up on eBay and you have the means, I, I highly recommend you don't sleep on it. Um, again, particularly if you want to be a writer. It, this is the book right here. Uh, so two more. Now, we talked about KeenCon. I showed the postcard earlier. Um, during that, uh, Jeff Cooper and I had gone to the airport to pick up Kelly Lehman, bring her back to my apartment. Uh, which meant we left Dick Lehman and Edward Lee alone and unsupervised in my apartment. And what they did is they got very drunk on tequila and Dick Lehman destroyed an antique wicker chair that had been my family for generations. And then they proceeded to go through my library and sign their books. Um, now I've, I've shown the Edward Lee one here on the channel before. In fact, uh, if those of you who were watching, uh, my interview with Edward Lee for, for Killer Con uh, for the Splatterpunk Awards when he got his J.F. Gonzalez Lifetime Achievement Award. I actually showed some of his inscriptions. He wrote the foulest, funniest things you've ever seen. Dick's were all sincere and heartfelt. Um, this one, for example, to Brian, persist and prevail, best wishes, Dick Richard Lehman. This is the seller. But this is not any copy of the seller. This is a copy of the seller that I bought at my newsstand, same newsstand where I used to buy comic books. And then I graduated to Stephen King novels and F. Paul Wilson novels and James Herbert novels. Um, I bought this there. Now, this was published in 1980. So I bought it sometime in 1980, uh, which means I rode my bike down there and bought this. Um, and this was like a bomb going off <laughs> to teenage Brian. Um, this is one of my most treasured possessions. I don't even keep this in the library. I actually keep this in a lockbox. Uh, so God forbid the house ever catches on fire, the feds break in, whatever, grab the lockbox and go. This is in there with my birth certificate and, and other things. Um, and that brings me to my final favorite. And this is one that, again, maybe folks don't know about. This is bad news. It's an anthology edited by Richard Lehman. Um, why is it my favorite? Because in addition to having people like F. Paul Wilson, Lucy Taylor, Rick Hodla, Nancy Holder, Bentley Little, um, Jack Ketchum, it, it had some folks who were very, very dear friends of mine who were, we were all starting out at the same time. And uh, when this dropped, it was our first hint that maybe we belonged to this this weird mutant family. Um, Tom Piccarelli, uh, Simon Clark, Jeff Cooper, Rain Graves. Um, every time I pick this up, and if I sound like I'm choking up now, it's because I am. I remember how fucking proud I was of them. And uh, this looks like a time machine. It takes me back. <laughs> So those are some of my favorite layman books. I see a lot of comments. We're going to get to those. Um, but I'm going to add a couple people to the stream right now. Uh, first of all, joining us, uh, he's the author of Answers of Silence and Retribution Incorporated and the host right here on YouTube of Blue Collar Heathen, Mr. Jeff Cooper. Can't hear you, buddy. Got to Got to unmute the mic. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Oh, man. So uh, that copy of Bad News. I, I, yeah. Talk about when, when you submitted to that and then talk about getting accepted. What was that like? Well, Dick asked me to, to send something. Okay. And, um, you know, he's like, you know, Hey, you know, so, but of course it's layman, right? So he doesn't tell you, he doesn't give you all the information. He never did. He always had, he'd be like, Hey, you got, you got a story laying around, not doing much that I could take a look at. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Here's this one. 
All right. So I sent it over to him, um, emailed it over to him. And he's like, you know, and then it was like a couple days later or something. He's like, Hey, I want to use this in, uh, in bad news. And I'm like, what, um, what? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, uh, you know, it, it was, I didn't know that I was submitting to it is really what it comes down to. And I was really surprised to, to get that and, you know, getting in there, it was, that was really cool. That was really cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, before we um, get he, to he, your... he... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. It's fine. It, it, it's just, uh, my story in there isn't very good, to be completely oh, honest. It really isn't. Oh, but man. it was really cool that, you know, he that he did give us a, you know, give us a shot, you know, at that, you know, and kept this in mind, you know, apparently the whole time because, you know, he was always, I mean, you've seen his filing system, but, you know, for, the, for you know, people that haven't, you know, Dick kept a, a like every piece of correspondence ever, you know, like everybody had their own file of, you know, emails and, you know, letters and stuff like that. You know, he had yep. all of that stuff that he could, um, you know, access and be like, okay, you know, this, this is what happened here. Um, so he would, he would take that and he would, you know, project forward with that, you know, to be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, you know, with with this guy, he has an interest in this. You know, he would know that. All right, you know, if you're going to go with, uh, I don't know, cars or you know something, you know, he would know who's into that. You know, who holds what position on what. I mean, he had all that shit down. <laughs> he did you remember uh, when he passed? Uh, we were up in the office with Kelly, and she showed us yeah. the files. Yeah, it was. It was uh, yeah. Files. Yeah, you know, and, and there's a, a file folder with your name, a file folder with my name, yep. every email, yep. every letter. It, it, yep. was, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like uh, J. Edgar Hoover, you know, yeah. just, you know, without the cross-dressing. Now, another one that's a favorite of mine, but I didn't hold it up until you joined, is, of course, Night and Low <laughs> <laughs> With Hell this yeah. particular cover. Night and Lonesome oh. October. <laughs> <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> now, you've, you've since graduated to, to this headwear, yeah. but back in the day, yeah. you were never without your beloved Jets cap. Yeah, um, well, that doesn't show up on a green screen now, does it? <laughs> <laughs> now, some people know this story, some don't. Again, Sympathy for the Devil. Back in print today, this story is recounted in there. Uh, your hat actually got stolen at that same party. Uh, yeah, at the same the party where he from... fell through the through the wicker chair. I was, I was, I was telling you out in the chat. I was calling you out yeah. because it was like it was. I was sitting there giggling my shit, stupid, watching you try not to be pissed off at Dick Layman for getting drunk and falling through great grandma's chair. That to me was fucking hilarious. <laughs> Me and Lee had a good giggle about that shit. <laughs> well, we had a good giggle in the months that followed as Yeah, you did, assholes. Hat on tour. <laughs> right. Right, 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 right. So you know, I know this is gonna come as a shock to everybody, but I think I might have slept that entire weekend about eight minutes, right? While these guys are all getting drunk, you know. I'm sitting here railed out on coffee and adrenaline and nothing but. So the reason they kept me around is because when they get blackout drunk on tequila, I can, rem you know, I would tell them, no, asshole, you actually said that shit. Also, I had no excuse for all the bullshit that I pulled at cons because I wasn't shit faced like everybody else. <laughs> but in my sleep deprived haze i had left my jets hat at brian's house and then i got back home to seattle and i'm like hey um not for nothing but i can't i can't find us you know did i leave it there and he's like nah man i ain't seen it i ain't seen it oh shit you know maybe it, you know maybe i did have it with me and i dropped it on the freaking plane or something i don't i don't know 
So I'm sitting there minding my own business. I go out to the mail and there's a postcard. <laughs> there's a picture of my Jets hat. I know it's mine because, you know, that thing had been through hell and back. It had been, you know, beat up and broken. I mean, that it, it, there was no mistaking it. It was definitely mine. So I got a postcard, you know, with my Jets hat. And I forget what the hell it was, you know, someplace weird. And I'm just like, so I called up Brian and I bitch him out, you know, figuring it's him. And he's swearing, no, nah, man, it isn't me. It isn't me. Huh? I don't know nothing about it. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and yeah, Brian's always full of shit. Okay. But I can usually tell when he's lying. I knew he was, but I also knew that he wasn't as involved in it as, you know, as I was thinking. So, okay. All right. Get another postcard and it's, um, it's like a Photoshop thing of my Jets had on, uh, Paula Garan. And this is back in the times where we were doing jobs in hell. And, uh, and Paula didn't care for us. All yeah. Over the yeah. Now. Paula. Uh, I was not on Paula Garan's Christmas card list, you know? Um, and <clears throat> was there a ransom? No, Jimmy Brown, there was not a ransom. Not, not yet. <laughs> I think one did come eventually, but no, not at that time. And so I would get these, I would get these letters with pictures of my Jets hat for, you know, in like random weird places. And then I get one, you know, Joe Lansdale's wearing it. <laughs> I'm like, are you fist fucking me right now? You know, and then I get one Bentley Little's wearing it. Bentley Little. Bentley Little, right? I mean, <laughs> that's like catching a, you know, catching a freaking unicorn. Nobody ever sees the guy ever, <laughs> you know, but here he is. He's wearing my freaking jets. I'm like, oh, what is actually happening here? And goes on, goes on, goes on. You know, my hat's in the Grand Canyon, my hat's here, my hat's there, my hat's everywhere. And then I get a videotape in the mail, a videotape, a VCR tape, you know, and, you know, for the kids that need a translation, yeah, yeah, it's one of them boomer devices you see in, you know, the oldie time movies, All right? So I play this freaking thing because, of course I do, because I'm a freaking masochist. And it is a clip from the David Letterman show. And there's, he reads a letter from Kelly frickin' Lehman, who said, hey, my friend Jeff lost his Jets hat at a party. Can you help him find it? And, you know, he does this whole skit around this frickin' letter. <laughs> Where he's like, no, I got it. And then he, you know, shows up in some guy's house and, you know, hands him back the hat. I mean, it was some dude, who, you know, clearly wasn't me. Oh, that but, was you know, hands part. him back the hat and then takes off with the guy's car. <laughs> so he did this whole skit around the damn thing. Let, Letterman pulls I didn't get it out. back until World Horror 2001. That's yeah. when I got that thing back. But the, the guy, the, the actor they had playing you, you know, Letterman pulls the hat out and says, yeah. well, well, Jeff, I have your hat. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy looked like Jonathan Jans. He could have played it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, clearly not me, but no, it was, I mean, oh, it was funny. It was funny. But, it was funny. But then it showed up on the cover of Night in Los Octo. <laughs> yeah, this thing never freaking ends. <laughs> and apparently, you know, he told uh, Alan M. Clark, who did the, the, uh, the illustration for that, <clears throat> said... Yo, hey, you know, the character on there, you know, has to be wearing this green, this green baseball hat. <laughs> and now, you know, apparently didn't tell Alan what the hell it was about either. You know, pulling the same shit with him that he pulled with me with bad news. Same type of thing. And here's here's the thing, folks. When Alan Clark does your cover, he doesn't just paint something. He calls you. He talks to you. He wants to know all about the book and about the characters. He wants all this information that informs what he's doing. And Dick Lehman just tells him, yeah, it has to wear a, a, a green ball cap. It doesn't explain why. Yeah. 
Oh, it was freaking hilarious. It showed up where it showed up. Uh, I think you had a MacGuffin with it. I I'm did. Pretty sure. It did did Tim? Levin. Uh, yeah, a bunch of people, man. I have so many people. It was in a Michael Slate. It was in one of the Michael Slate ones. Yep. Yeah, my freaking Jets had got more mileage than I did. Yeah, I I I used it in Castaways. <laughs> so, Coop, your favorite layman books. <clears throat> Um, my favorite layman books, uh, you know, it, as far as the novel, I would say Savage. Savage is probably my favorite layman novel. Um, it's a departure from his, you know, from the slash fests, you know, of like, uh, Island and, you know, Quake, Beast House type of stuff. I mean, it's, it's not that, um, it's more... I mean, it, it's more a coming of age, you know, story in a way. Right. You know, uh, not in a way, very much, you know, as a coming of age story. You know, Savage, it's a 15 year old kid in uh, Whitechapel in England in, the, uh, in 1888, November. And he postulates that the reason that the the Whitechapel murders from uh, Jack the Ripper, you know, ceased like that. And just, you know, was that Jack had a witness to the last murder. Um, what the hell was her name? I'm sorry. There's a train coming here. Um, <laughs> That's not a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a train coming. There's literally a train coming. So I apologize for that. You know, you I know, can't do nothing about it. You but and there I, was a win of Mary Kelly, right? Mary Kelly. In the first year we that that we recorded the horror show with Brian Keene, you and I did the Richard Lehman tribute episode. I'm and gonna mute remember, a bit. Hear the train. We we recorded it at your house in the same room you're you're appearing. And there were trains the whole way through that episode. <laughs> All right, while Coop is muted, uh, I'm going to bring some other folks into the stream. She is the queen, the new queen of extreme horror and the Splatterpunk award-winning author of Lake House Infernal, Sperm Jackers from Hell, and the Night Silver River Run Red. Hello, Christine Morgan. Hello. And uh, also joining us, He's another Splatterpunk award-winning author whose books include Cruel Summer, Resisting Madness, One for the Road, and with Summer Cannon, Slaves of Gravity. Hey there, Wesley Southerd. Hey, what's up? What's up? And finally, he's the best-selling author of well over a dozen novels, including Exorcist Falls, Dust Devil, The Nightmare Girl, and The Raven. Hey there, Jonathan Jans. Hello, my brother, and hello, everybody. Good and to see good you. Good you. I know you're still muted. But you can verify that is, in fact, the actor that David Letterman used when Richard Lehman and Kelly Lehman enlisted him to play a prank on you. He's Jonathan Jans' doppelganger. <laughs> Have any of you ever seen a video of that? I haven't. I got to look it up now. No. No. Could we, uh, I don't have a copy. I'm sure you do. No? There's still trains going. Okay. Well, Kelly, if you're out there listening... We really, really, really the, the public deserves a copy of that. Right. Would right. it be on would it be on YouTube? It's not, believe no. it or not. So it's all right. Weird. Um while Coop is still muted, this will be a rare moment for everyone else to talk. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, I see Dave, I see Dave Scow hanging out in chat. By the way, uh, for those joining us late, um Welcome to what I'm calling the Keen Stream. We're going to do these every month, once or twice a month. Uh, coming up in future streams, we will have David J. Scow, Cynthia Paleo, Tim Wagner, Gabino Iglesias, and more. Um, if you like this Richard Lehman Christmas special, we're going to do other holiday specials, an Edward Lee Arbor Day special or James <laughs> Herbert Valentine's Day special. I don't know. The possibilities are endless. The um, Edward Lee Arbor Day. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, get, I I think he needs to be. I think he needs to be uh, uh, Valentine's Day for sure. Valentine's Day. I mean, there's so much love in his book with between people and book. monsters and yeah, yeah. All right, the coop. Before there were trains, you were you were telling us 
Savage is your favorite of your favorite layman novel. Yeah. Yeah, Savage is my favorite Lehman novel. Um, postulates that the uh, Jack the Ripper murders uh, stopped suddenly because there was a witness to the last murder in uh, 1888, the witness being a 15-year-old boy. Now, and then uh, Jack pretty much fucked off to uh, the U.S., and, you know, and then it kind of becomes an, a, a Western kind of thing. And the reason I like it is, I mean, it's a coming of age thing. It's got Jack the Ripper. It's got, you know, it's got kind of a Western vibe, you know, but, you know, mostly, mostly the coming of age thing. I don't think that there's, you know, 15, when you're 15, right, everything is, you know, changing so damn quick for you. You know, you realize that, man, this is you know, the world is not going to be the same after, you know, this type of thing. And I don't think that you could possibly set a story with that at a better time than the late Victorian era, you know, when, you know, with all of the industrialization and technological advances that were happening in the world, you know, I think that that works, you know, great together. And, you know, let's face it, we all love Lehman, but I mean, he was a bit sophomoric you know when he was talking about you know particularly when he was talking about women no yeah slightly no, no. but the thing is if you're putting that from the head of a 15 year old little shit <laughs> you know it you know it it passes over a bit well so you know that's uh that's just some you know random coop thoughts on you know on savage yeah um <laughs> Also, dig uh, writer's tale. I know that you know you'd already mentioned it, you know, but to me, you know, that was super, super, super important, and you know, I have no problem um, making kids like Wes, you know, jealous that you know mine was you know signed by Dick. So you know, fuck you, Wes. Me? Oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> you know you. Talking of signed ones, I showed uh, that copy of the seller Dick signed. Another one he signed was my copy of Fiends. And Christine, I'm jealous of the copy that you you posted the picture. Yours is in much better shape. Mine, uh, my my ex wife Cassandra and I, we experienced a really bad flood years ago. And my copy of Fiends, as you can see, I don't, I don't know how well the audience can see it, but it's it's warped, and there's actually mold on the pages. Uh, I've done my best to save it and restore it as best I can. Uh, I keep it sealed in plastic. I broke it out for this. But yeah, your copy, I'm very jealous of your copy. Well, I'm jealous. I still haven't read a writer's tale. Yeah. Well, let's let's go yeah. with you guys. And unlike Coop and I, I, I don't believe any of you ever had the chance to actually meet Dick Lehman. So you only know him through his uh, book and through people like us. Um Christine, what was your first layman? Do you remember? Well, it turns out my first layman was the seller, though I didn't realize it at the time. The, the first one that made a noticeable impression on me as an adult was uh, One Rainy Night, which came to me through the Leisure Horror Book Club. And I know they did a lot of shitty things and screwed over a lot of good people, but that book club introduced me to so many of my favorite authors and yep. dear friends now that I would not be who and where I am today without it. So I, I've, I remember you know, looking forward to those two books arriving every month. And with this one, I can't tell you what day it was. My, my memory is very specific in some ways and not in others. But I remember being on the exercise bike at our house in Everett, thinking, all right, let's try this one rainy night. And... Up until then, yeah, I don't know. It was just this moment of, this is sick. This is 
got sex and violence and it's really horrible and we can do that <laughs> <laughs> and there was this moment of epiphany of like oh, we can do that and later when i started reading others of his i would get to seller and go hey wait i read this when i was younger and i must have gotten it from the library because for years later i could never remember who had done it if it was real and i thought did i just imagine that whole book but then to find it again was like okay good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not imagine that and then i went on as that picture i showed i posted for you was like i have to get everything i can which included someone in the UK who was selling off all their paperbacks. And mm. the shipping was horrible, but it was like, I was not going to pass that up. That was right. a, a once in a lifetime chance to get all those. Now, Wes, I saw you nodding when Christine brought up the Leisure Book Club. And oh, I know I'm talking to you. That's how you discovered me. That's how you discovered a, a lot of authors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm definitely I'm definitely a product of the of the the leisure of like the mid 2000s for sure. So talk about it. what what was your first introduction to Layman? Uh, dude, I wish I could remember honestly. Like I like I have I'm looking at some of them some of my leisure ones right now here and behind me and I honestly couldn't even tell you which one was the first one. I I just I could tell you my favorites for sure, but um I want to say it may have been Island, I believe, may have been one of my first ones, which is still my favorite of his books. I I love Island, and not yeah. just because the bad guy has my same has my name, uh, but it's uh, I I don't know, man. Like uh, I just his stuff, it just kind of like Christine said, just kind of opened my eyes to like what you can and can't do in horror and. And uh, definitely a lot of rump for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of right. Um, I think some of the first text messages that Brian and I actually sent back to each other was like, "Okay, we got the new layman." Yeah, okay. First, first rump on page one thirty-two. No. <laughs> No, but it's, it's funny, uh, Christine mentioning getting like the leisure, uh, being part of the leisure book club. I, I wasn't a part of the leisure book club necessarily, but every month I was going to, I think it was either Barnes and Noble or Borders. I think it was Borders. I had a deal with them where they were setting aside um, both leisure books that came out every month. And I would get them the Friday before they came out on that Tuesday. And I would go and pick them up and yeah, man, I'm I'm definitely I'm definitely a product of the leisure of of like the mid two thousands leisure and and yeah, definitely layman was always in there, especially like what, by the time I was getting into it, um, stuff like like flesh and beware and stuff was just coming out through them. So that's what that's I think that was kind of around the time I was starting to just read him. Yeah. Now, Jonathan, you and, and I I'm on record as saying this: if you had started just a little earlier. You, you would have been one of these superstars at leisure. I mean, you you would have been. Um, how about you? How did you, did you also discover Layman through leisure or was it before that? Yeah, it was a little bit before that. Um, I'm, I'm just looking through, I, I just a moment ago, I went and snatched a bunch of paperbacks off my shelves. I didn't get all of them, but I found like 17 of them. Most of them are leisure. Um, like I think some of them are like re-releases to leisure maybe, but right. um, like here are a couple. These are uh, what are their headline? Yeah, the head that was his UK publisher. Yeah. Okay, so so that's that's when I first became acquainted with Layman, and that would have been the late nineties, I think. Yeah. Um, so I had just begun yeah. teaching at that at that time, and I was I drive I taught in the middle of nowhere, and I drive to this bookstore in Lafayette or West Lafayette, which was a big town compared to where I taught. And there was this little bookstore, a little uh, like mom and pop place. And they always had like 12 or 14 of these layman headline books. And so I discovered him through that. The first book I read, I don't have it with me. I think I loaned it out and never got it back, was The Woods Are Dark. Um, and yeah, yeah. I didn't even realize how controversial or, um, you know, I, I didn't realize the whole backstory to The Woods Are Dark until today. Um, because the only version I'd ever read was this the headline version. Oh, yeah. 
I didn't know that it had been, you know, heavily edited and that he was unhappy and that Cemetery Dance did another version in 2008. Um, but just shows you how little I know because for me, that book was really a revelation. Um, as, as dissatisfied as he was with it, that version, um, for me, it was very eye opening, kind of like uh, Christine and Wesley have just alluded to. It was yeah. completely different than anything I'd ever read. Yeah, I've got um, I've got that really nice Cemetery Dance hardcover that came out back in like '08. Okay, sorry about the glare. That's that was, yeah, I think this is the, I think this is the unedited version, I believe. Yeah, so that's the one that he approved, right? That's more like the director's cut. Uh, I believe so. This came out this came out in 08, so it had been several years after he passed away. But yeah, it says the restored and uncut edition. Yeah, so. What happened is he kept he kept the original manuscript and all of the excised chapters and the original ending. I mean, and it's not like. Well, it's it's my stream, so I'm sure I got a lot of readers. Um, it's not like when I put out the author's edition of the rising with the 30,000 words that got cut out. I mean, there are, it is a fundamentally different novel, the, the cemetery dance edition of the woods are dark. Um, but what happened, you know, Kelly in going through the estate papers found all of that excised material. And, and she, she related to, I think Coop, I think you were with me. I think it's when we went out to dinner with her one time when she was still here, it, it was like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. Um, but I know she worked very hard on that, and uh, you know, kudos to Cemetery Dance for bringing it out. Um, you yeah. know, if if you're a layman fan and you haven't read that one, right after you finally track down a copy of Writer's Tale, that should be the next thing you track down. The, the Cemetery Dance yeah. edition of The Woods Are Dark. So that was definitely. You feel like that was definitely much more of his vision or a version he would have been much happier with than the one that. Because I think he was very unhappy with the original version, um, or at least he said. I mean, the earlier version it said he felt that that had like t t torpedoes torpedoed his uh, his you know publishing career in America. Uh, yeah, it was. he was. Uh, it was not dissatisfied with. Terminal. Yeah, it was his terminal. I mean, it almost killed his career. Um, you know, we I I showed. Uh, Tread softly earlier mentioned that he, he wrote it under the pseudonym Richard Kelly. One of the reasons he had to use those pseudonyms was because of, of what Woods or Dark did to his career here in the U.S. Wow. Um, yeah, it took him a long time to recover from that. So, I mean, he was he was he never got to see that edition published. Um, and you know, I know every one of us has different thoughts on on the afterlife and if there even is an afterlife. But in 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 my mind's eye. He's he's sitting in that hotel convention bar right about at the end of the road, and he's got a big fucking grin on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Published. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So for all of you, um, and look, we each each one of us has very different writing style, and and we write very different things, but. It's fair to say that that each of us have, in fact, been influenced by Layman in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a bit, and let's go in reverse. Uh, Jans, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think that I was thinking about this today a little bit. Uh, there are two ways. I, I feel like what he did for me, because, um, you know, like I said, I was a young teacher, so I was just out of, you know, fresh out of university and you don't really read stuff like that in, in you know, you know, in a, in a college classroom. And in, in my self-education was basically uh, Stephen King's Dance Macabre Index. So and basically that reading list he put in the back, I, I just tried to read everything on that list. And there's a cool diversity on that list, but it tends more toward, you know, I, I read a lot of Ramsey Campbell who is a far cry from Richard Lehman. Um, I read, you know, like Robert Marasco and uh, Peter Straub and guys like that. Again, very different than what Lehman did. And so there was really nothing on that list. The closest maybe that I could come to it was James Herbert. Um, Herbert could get pretty wild, right? With books like, um, you know, The Rats and others like that. Absolutely. There are quite a few deaths and all that stuff. But with Lehman, I, I felt like the boundaries were just destroyed in two ways. One way was, I think, the, the way that you guys are talking about, Christine and, and Wesley, that like all bets are off. 
you know, the violence, the, the sexual content, you know, you don't think he's going to go there and then he goes there and then he goes 10 steps farther. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was a real uh, eye opener for me. I was <clears throat> stunned uh, by what I was reading. I just hadn't encountered that kind of stuff. Um, probably another one that was close to it was Lansdale's The Night Runners. That was one that, that went that got pretty wild, but maybe that was the wildest book I'd read before Layman. But the other way, I think, even more importantly for me as a writer, that it destroyed boundaries was it didn't adhere to the narrative rules that I guess I was used to. And I'm not saying that any of those aforementioned writers adhere to any rules, but I could never quite anticipate, anticipate where Layman was going to go. And I found that to be really, really um refreshing and i think i think again ramsey campbell peter straub they can be very very unpredictable but the the thing about layman is he does it with such pace um he he has the fastest pace while while maintaining interest of any writer i had read up until that point and so just when you had recovered started to recover from the last shock he's veering off in a new direction and I was reading some Goodreads reviews today, and, and some some readers were, were calling that, you know, just haphazard and unmotivated and this or that. But for whatever reason, with me, those twists all landed. Those twists did seem motivated, or at least in retrospect, they seemed to make sense to me. Maybe because I was depraved deep down, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but but like when the when the father, there's a father character in that book who <laughs> I think he's into Shakespeare, or he starts quoting Shakespeare. For whatever reason. That made sense to me that he would do that <laughs> at the time. And, and so I felt like it was, I felt like he, at the keyboard, he was creating something <laughs> in a very fast paced, liberated way. And I guess like to me that, um, that allowed me to, 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 to bring some of that to my own, my own writing eventually. I didn't write anything until years later, but, but when I did, I think that, you know, Layman was still there with me a little bit. Right. Wes, what about you? I mean, my answer is going to be a lot less eloquent than that. I uh, I work on an assembly line. I don't get to talk in front of people all day, um, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, I think his stuff just kind of – it was so early on in my, in my writing when I started reading him that it just made me realize that, yeah, you can do anything – you can do anything that you want in this stuff. You don't have to hold back. I mean, if you want to do the violence or the, or the sex or just all the crazy shit that you want, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because there's always going to be an audience for it. And, and you just are able, you just, if, if you have the guts to do it, to just to do it. And, you know, for me getting into him was out of, was out of, uh, you know, Brian, probably Brian's recommendation online before, before I even knew him. Um, but that like, like his, but like Layman begat Ed Lee begat Jack Ketchum for, I mean, for me personally, and then, you know, to the, to the other like darker stuff and, and, uh, I feel like I'm rambling. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I, I've just, I've always really enjoyed his stuff. His stuff's always, it's always meant a lot to me, but it's, it, there's some stuff that I feel didn't age well, I guess with me. Cause I tried to read something of his recently that I would never read. And it's been maybe like 10 years since I've actually read anything from him. Cause when I first gotten into him, I read everything that I could. I mean, I'd read kind of like, like I'm in like a really big Bentley little kick right now and I'm reading everything. And that's how I was maybe 10 years ago with, with Layman's stuff. And I tried to reread one of his things recently. And there was just a scene at the beginning where there was this little kid just groping on this girl. And I was just reading it thinking like, Ugh, like, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I've kind of grown up a little bit more and it's just not doing it for me anymore. But I don't know for me back then it was, it just, everything worked for me. And, uh, I don't know, man, I just, I, I've always just been such a big fan of his stuff and, and, and just, I feel like I kind of grew up reading his stuff and, and, and it was just such a big influence on me early on. And I don't know if his stuff, I don't know if I like write quite like him, maybe like I used to, but like, I, like when I was kind of emulating stuff, but um, I'm sure if I went back and reread it, it probably came out a little bit stronger back then. You know, you raise an interesting point before we go to Christine and Coop. Um, Mary and I had this discussion earlier this year. Um, 
we, we started talking about Savage. And, you know, we both feel that in the case of H.P. Lovecraft, your appreciation of his work depends on how old you were when you discovered him. Yeah. Uh, if you discover him too old, too into this, you see all the flaws. Um, in the case of Lehman, you know, as Coop said earlier, there, there is absolutely a sophomore event to his right. Uh, oh. Lehman knew who his audience was and broke that audience. Uh, you know, I I loved Savage when I was younger. Going back and rereading it, I can feel about it the same way I did. Um, you know, so so there is that. But you you see, my my point was, you see in his later works, like the Traveling Vampire Show, uh, right. like Night and Lonesome October. You know, there was a no writer ever stops growing. Writers, you know, our 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 style continues to to change. The longer we do this, uh, a great example is Stephen King. Um, Bag of Bones is not a novel that the guy who wrote Dead Zone or Cujo could have written um, if if he had tried to write Bag of Bones back then, uh, or the you know the stories in Just After Sunset. I, I think they would have been markedly different stories. Um, Layman was evolving as well, and and I think it's 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 unfortunate that we didn't get to see where that went. Yeah, um, but Christine, let's let's go to you. Yeah. All right. Refreshing my memory. I just woke up from memory. I know. I, I'm this far into a bottle <laughs> of two bar whiskey. <laughs> Jans, what what was the question? <laughs> 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 I, I think I think it's how yeah what 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 is the how the influence how is the influence right? writing yeah all right wait hold on I'm getting mobbed by cats right. <laughs> yeah it was definitely that moment of we can do that and the pace thing like you mentioned I mean there's never a dull moment in a layman book and reading it you had the sense that. When he was writing it, he was just like, we're going to blow past all the dull stuff. And we're just going to have fun. And that, I think, made made a huge impression on me because that's what I try to do now. Um, if if an influence, of all my stuff, probably Sperm Jackers from Hell has the most layman influence where it was just, the characters are all young guys, you know, I'm going to write this for, and, and here I am, you know, a old white lady, <laughs> um, writing these books with all these young male characters that was not something that, that I knew. But, and yet I did, because I've been a gamer, all that, and it was like, we're just going to have fun with this and see where it goes. Um, and I probably worked rump in there a few times too. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't remember, but another, another big influence that I think gets overlooked a lot because of the content is how many female characters Layman had and, you know, yeah. well written, strong, proactive female characters who were actually doing stuff. Admittedly, Absolutely. yeah, and I mean, I there's one of his, I, I'm pretty sure I can't remember which one that really does. She's focused a lot too much on her breasts for the situation, <laughs> and that is one of those things we see a lot now of you know, guys writing female characters. But even at that point, I was thinking when you're being dragged down the hall by a serial killer. Nobody's going to be that worried about how high up her top is riding and if her <laughs> boots are going to fall down. <laughs> but it was that one particular moment. <laughs> so it's like, all right, this might be pushing it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> is it just me or is Brian's computer <laughs> having a seizure? Oh, it is. What the, <laughs> to be one of those mentor. Um, Brian, Brian, I, shush. I, Brian, shush. I can I can upload this, <laughs> right? Because nobody can hear you. Your your audio is 444 shades of Jack. You're like freezing up and stuff. Oh no. Um, layman's influence on me as far as the writing was that never throw anything away. Never throw anything away. Even if you don't use it now, you cut it out and use it later. Hmm. Put it in a file somewhere. Hold on to that damn thing. You know, and, you know, you can, th there, there may be a time for it. And there may be a time to revisit that. Um, you know, how to take the, the, the stories that we all live in our, in our daily lives. You know, Brian was talking about, uh, you know, Quake, you know, for example, you know, that whole, you know, trying to get back to Ann and Kelly bit, you know, that was the impetus behind Quake. You know, how, you know, different ways that you could tap into the stories that we all live, you know, to connect with the reader. Um, and I, I think those are probably the two main things that that I picked up from Layman as far as the the actual writing bit. Um, you know, what I got a lot more from Layman was about the writing business bit, you know, and he made damn sure that I understood what the hell was, you know, was happening at, you know, point A, B and C and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, he, he was a fantastic resource for that. And, you know, particularly, at, you know, at that point, you know, in time. Because you know who are we? We were a bunch of, you know, we were a bunch of punks with a, <laughs> with an email newsletter, <laughs> you know that, you know people actually paid attention to for reasons beyond comprehension. <laughs> no, it wasn't beyond comprehension. It was because of my monthly article where I would just go sideways about whatever the hell was pissing me off. <laughs> but um, you know that that was the that was the main bit. You know, Dick Dick was a was a big mentor to me to you know, actually try to survive the, the writing gig, you know, and understand, you know, this, these are the kind of monsters that you're actually going to deal with, you know, and they have addresses in New York city. Is my sound better now? Yes, you do. But okay. you, you were really cutting out before it was like, it, it, uh, it's, it's been happening on and off the whole time. It, it, yeah. It, it, it. Did we lose turtle? Yeah, no, it was like that. Hey, no, who's I'm, who's that new guy that just popped up on the on the other side? I'm uh, out when this Okay. Oh, keep we lost Keen again. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Sorry, right. I should just kick. I should just kick him get, out and take over the <laughs> take over the thing like I usually yeah, do. I, I'm, <laughs> really. When the stars are right, he'll, he'll uh, rejoin. Right, right, right. <laughs> the window, the window. <laughs> now, Coop, you know, um, since you're in charge now, um, <laughs> John, uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier uh, when he was talking um, about how a lot of layman stuff seemed like it was always going, it was very unpredictable and going in a lot of different directions that he wasn't aware, like that the reader was always surprised by. Um, since you knew him better than than pretty much all of us, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I'm oddly okay with that, being. <laughs> um, was was he not notorious for being like a pantser when he wrote? Like he didn't he didn't outline. He just sat down and just went for it. Right. I thought I'd been told that many times. He 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 would you know to yeah he he liked to keep moving. You know he yeah. liked he liked to keep moving in you know, as he, as he was writing, you know, when he had to, you know, slow down and really plot stuff out, um, you know, he'd be like, all right, this, this novel, there's a whole bunch of words that, and nothing's happening. You know, you know, Dick would say, you know, Dick would tell you, you know, 
if there's not enough verbs on the page, you know, this isn't good. <laughs> you know, he wants things going down. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, but yeah, he, he would definitely, definitely focus on that. How about yeah. now? Yeah, I'm now you're all right. Good, good yeah. for the moment. Good for the moment. All but right. I mean, Coop's yeah. in charge now, so. No, stop. <laughs> Let me introduce Wiley before I cut out again. Uh, yeah. He's an author whose books include the critically acclaimed The Magpie Coffin, Catfish in the Cradle, and with Stephen Kozanowski, The Perfectly Fine House, Wiley Young. But hold your thought. Hold your thought. <laughs> before I cut out again, Coop, I, I want to echo with what you said. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about bad news earlier. Mm -hmm. I gave you and rainy and oh, pick there goes and many of our friends are shit that book. Hold on, I'll translate from yeah. stuttering Brian in the chat. Yeah, aren't <laughs> better now? No. Yeah. Oh, I fixed it in the no. chat. Don't worry about it, dude. <laughs> yes, yeah? no. My better? No, you're good. For the you're moment. There, yeah. Use your words. <laughs> I agree with you about what he taught us about the business. Yes. Um, I've I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I would not have a career without Richard Lehman. I've I've been blessed to get counsel and advice from F. Paul Wilson, David Scow, John Skip, Joe Lansdale. Stephen King, etc. Okay, but I wouldn't have a career without Richard Lehman. Um, and there, there's a lot of us who can say that. Um, but Wiley, you're joining us now. I uh, does anybody need to hop off, Christine? I know you have to work at some point tonight. Uh, for a few hours, I'm still good. Okay. Coop, how are you, about are you trying to kick off the only woman on this show, Brian? Come on. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, being yeah, it's 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 like you brought this kid 20, in. It's almost 2021, man. That's not good. Cool. Fuck's sake. All right, so you brought this kid in. He's been sitting here. He ain't said nothing because you've been trying to talk through your stuttering. So you have wow, tell us about tell tell us about you. What's going on? You know, what, what, what are you saying? You log off, right? <laughs> we'll kick Brian off. It's only him. <laughs> Hey, look at that. Oh, yeah. oh shit. <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Wiley. See how quick I can get across the river, asshole. <laughs> oh, fantastic, Wes. All right. Wiley, what was your first Lehman novel? How did you discover Dick Lehman? It was in a used bookstore in my hometown, the only used bookstore that there was that I could go with my quarters and, you know, beg, beg, is this enough, sir? I barely have enough. And so I've picked out a copy of One Rainy Night that I then took to school and read oh, in yeah. front of uh, a lot of teachers that I then got sent to the counselor's office for. Yeah, everyone holds your copies up. What's the what, what's this about? How old were you? My reading teacher, and the, they said, "I put, put the page, put, yeah, took the pages." And I was like, go. "Look, look right here, <laughs> look at it." And it was obviously one of you know one of Richard Layman's sex scenes, and I was like, "Not that page, the other one." <laughs> How old were you? I was fourteen. Fourteen. That's the perfect yeah. age to read Layman. <laughs> it was it was fantastic. The uh, and I at that, that was the probably the first mainstream horror novel that I had read that was you know extreme and and violent and everything that I was ever looking for in a horror novel. That because at that point all I would had was Dean Koontz and R.L. Stein. So now is that your favorite, or do you do you have a different favorite? No, that that still to this day is my favorite. I yeah because it. Uh, and everything that I wanted to do when I started writing is small town setting, uh, witch doctor in an attic, <laughs> and, which is the creepiest scene in that entire book. And this whole thing, this one event that just spirals out of control and take, takes apart all these long held resentments that are bubbling below the surface of this small town. And that's all I've ever wanted to do in writing is write a book like that. And, <laughs> 
I have yet to do so, so we're still working to it. Not enough rumps, I think. But it, it, it's fair to say, more probably more so than anybody on the stream, um, in your pros, in your style, it, it's 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 easy to see that Layman was a big influence on you. Oh yeah, very. Um, much so. You know, even even in, even in your western. Um, which, you know, I, I, when I brought you on, I said to critically acclaim the Magpie Coffin. Well, there's a reason it's critically acclaimed. Um, it's a, it's a fantastic novel. You call it a splatter Western. You may have kind of invented your own subgenre there with that. Uh, Ooh. but, but that thing's, the, I mean, yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> but I mean that, you know, layman's influence on that is, 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 is very visible. Yeah, very much so. The, uh, with Magpie, I sat down and tried to emulate his style of fast pace. Not a lot of dwelling on, on a lot of details, which worked out well, I'd say, on this one. I don't know if it'll work out in the future, but at this one, I was like, we don't need to know backstory on this character. We don't need to know super intel super detailed backstories on a lot of other others. We're in the moment, and this is happening, and it doesn't need to slow down. Well, I want to share a Richard Lehman related Wild East story that he has not heard me share before. Um, so, you know, Coop and I were lucky enough to meet Dick. We first met him online in a chat room and, you know, build up a friendship with him, meet him in person. You know, it accelerates to the point where he's breaking great grandma's wicker chair, as Coop talked about earlier. Um, but the first time I met him in person, uh, it was actually the same weekend I met Coop in person. It was uh, the World Horror Convention, refresh my memory, Coop, 98, 99, somewhere around there. Um, and even though... 99. 99. Even though I talked to Lehman online, to meet him in person, I was, I was sort of fucking starstruck. I, I couldn't talk. And I was supposed to be interviewing him, and I couldn't talk. Um, fast forward to that really terrible there goes again. final world horror convention in the middle of what Bali. It was 2016. World. It was in Provo, Utah. Utah. Yep. Not even Salt Lake City. Provo, Utah. Utah. Yeah. Oh yes. Wow. Am I cutting out or am I audible? Yeah, you're cutting out. Cutting out. God damn it. Hang on. Am I cutting out now? No. Okay. All of you, all of you in the green room, just wait. Um anyway, that, that really terrible final world horror. Uh it's your first one. Yep. And uh I get there late after the flights from hell. It was like two in the morning Utah time. It's like four in the morning my time. And uh, all I want to do is check into the hotel and go to fucking bed. And before I can even do that, there's my dear friend Kelly Lehman, daughter of Richard Lehman, with you. And I could tell right away you, you're a Brian Keene fan. You just you had the smile that you have right now. Yeah. Uh, but she introduces me to you, and then while you're still over there making the face you're making right now, she she kind of whispers in my ear, "He's you when I met my dad. When he's you when you met my dad." And that was it. I stayed up with you, and we talked, yeah. and uh, it was a nice full circle moment for me. And and you gave me that, and I thank you for that. Uh, I felt I felt close to my mentor that evening. I, pre I appreciated the two o'clock in the morning talk. Yeah, I was, it was very much appreciated. And well, as I say, it was a full circle moment for you. That was the beginning for me. I mean, it, you know, Coop and I have talked, Dick did a lot for a lot of us. And so did so many others, Dallas Mayer and, and Lee and, and so many others that we mentioned tonight. Uh, but a Dave fella. Yeah. That Dave fella, is he still is he still in the chat? I don't see him there. When when we have Dave, I didn't next check month, When we have Dave Dave Scala next month, we have to tell the story of uh, 
the party at his house in Feo Monte. Oh my god. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but no, while while sincerely, I I uh I thank you for that night. Uh it, that was that that meant a lot to me. Uh it was it was nice to be able to to do for somebody else what Dick Lehman had once done for me. So I mean, you're a pain in my ass now. You send me memes and you text me all the time. I never did that to Lehman because memes didn't exist back then. <laughs> I was saying that, that, that wasn't because you wouldn't have. <laughs> Point. You got, right, there, you got there at 2 a.m. and you said, I want to go back. I said, you only thought. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the folks on the stream who have been waiting patiently. Folks. There's a lot of comments, and I know there were questions, um, but there's a lot to, to scroll through. So if you have questions, pop them up now, but I'm, I'm going to go through. Uh, is the clip from the Letterman show available anywhere? Not that we know of, um, but if, if we can ever track one down, we will. But it, it's not bullshit. David Letterman, yeah. through the machinations of the Lehman family, actually had Coop's hat. <laughs> <laughs> on set and worked it into a skit that night uh, with an actor that playing Coop that bared a remarkable resemblance to Jonathan James. <laughs> I got to see this, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was, it was wild. And the thing is, you know, let's, you know, we're talking, you know, we're talking about Dickhead, but, but the thing is, is, you know, Kelly sent it in not through any, you know, special back channel or anything like that at all. That was just your regular mailbag. <laughs> Your regular mailbag thing, and he picked it up and freaking and took it. All right, I'm still scrolling through. There's a whole essay by David Scow in the comments about how I can save this copy of Flesh. So I'm gonna yep. save that for later. But we're not letting you anywhere near chlorine gas. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> I should point out, Coop and listeners, Mary is gone for a month. Mm -hmm. uh, Cassandra and Dungeon Master 77.1 have moved into their home. That means I am home alone in this big house for an entire month. Terrifying. So the best adult you're, supervision that Brian has is the fucking cat. Yes. But you're not totally feral yet. Not yet. Yes. Not yet. Yes. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Cooper, are you seeing strange lights across the river coming from his house? <laughs> 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 You're going to be the dad from Woods or Dark, aren't you? You're going to <laughs> walk around quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Malaman joining us. He's trying to track down a copy of Writer's Tale. He says it's hard to find. It is hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I said it. But Josh, I yeah. love you and I trust you. If you Screw want to borrow you, my copy of a Writer's Tale, <laughs> I will. I will lend it to you. Reach DM me, text me. I I will mail you my copy of the writer's tale. Didn't you say you were leaving that to me? I'm leaving it to Wes when I die. It's actually it, okay. it's in my estate. Then it, then it's not going anywhere because I need that guaranteed at your place. All right, no, I don't wait, want, wait. I don't want that I don't want that book to be in Michigan with, my, with Josh. Yes, Dave. I'm scared, I'm scared it won't get back. You, you well, said I, gonna, I can read it if there are white gloves like a museum curator. I just no, 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 no. Nobody else gets to touch it. It's mine. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Chris, hey, Josh, Josh, you, if you want to borrow mine? Terrible, terrible mistake. I'll, I'll, I'll take yours. You have to come down and visit me first. Oh, I plan on it. Uh oh, to Keen Freeze again. Probably. Did I freeze again? Probably. I think you did. Just, yeah. Did just for a minute. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's getting. Uh, it's getting it's terrible. Mistake. Hang on. Let me try something. Am I frozen now? Who's <laughs> <laughs> cool? That was the problem. It's so quiet in here. Right. That's the problem. Oh. It's you, Cooper. <laughs> now it's just say, all the Welcome to the internet. God's will or Coop's fault. Are you two actually across the river from each other? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's it. There's a finite yeah. Wi-Fi. He's taking yeah. half. You're literally three. Out. Literally three of us live like ten minutes apart from each other. Mm -hmm. Another crank in the machine. Yeah. No. The Josh, hamster uh, running Brian's freaking uh, modem is getting tired. <laughs> it must be. 
All right, let me let me try this. Josh made oh. the terrible mistake of inviting Mary and I out to Michigan. Um, unfortunately, oh. the pandemic hit. But when the pandemic is over, we would take him up on that. So I will get your copy of A Writer's Tale back, Wes. Although it no. bothers me that you're waiting for me to die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the copy of The King in Yellow you have, and you said I could have. So, you know, we're all waiting on that. <laughs> These guys, they're like buzzards. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Time out, time out, time out. Let's, let's just pause a moment here. What copy of The King in Yellow are you talking about there, Wiley? Could you maybe describe the cover real quick? Hold that thought. No, 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 you <laughs> fucked up. You fucked up. The, cha the uh, chambers? No, that book, that book ain't yours anymore, man. Is mm. he for he's for us again? Yeah, he's he's like yeah, yeah, that's it. Someone destroyed it, didn't they? Well, here's the thing. I sold that book to Brian. Right? <laughs> I sold that book to Brian with the caveat that it wouldn't go anywhere else. And that you fucked up when the time I came, I could buy that back. <laughs> So, am I unfrozen? Am I frozen? You're unfrozen. Oh, yeah, for the I'm moment. Unfrozen. So, this is the way my estate reads in the, in the <laughs> notarized document. Um, upon my death, Stephen Kosinowski and Mike Lombardo, who are executors of the estate, Coop gets first option to purchase this back. If he does not, it goes to Wiley Young. If Coop purchases it back, Wiley Young gets this edition. So, either way, you, get you take you get the scholastic of. edition. That's why we are, we are like I, this, this close to our own version of Knives Out right now. No, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't have two, two copies of anything. I have two copies of Chamber <laughs> King in Yellow for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, partially uh, because he also knows that I could hit him with a rifle from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to questions. Uh, if the internet will let me. A lot of talk about chlorine gas. <laughs> yeah, you can't handle fire. <laughs> Too soon. I, I maybe get that book earlier than I thought. <laughs> Mm. All right. Well, if I, I can't get the comments to refresh to see if there are questions or not, I know there were a bunch of questions before, but I can't get to them. And I can do it through the YouTube, maybe. Everybody's talking about chlorine gas and being frozen. So if <laughs> yeah. there are no questions, I'm going to call it a night. <laughs> Coop, you got it? Yeah, I'm just, I'm on the, uh, I'm not going through the stream lat, uh, the stream yard one yeah, when we, the other one. And when it first went live, Coop, I saw some questions. Do they need up. to be about Layman? Because you've got an Optimus Prime question about Brian Keene here. Yeah. What? Where the fuck is that? Um, I don't know shit about Transformers. It, it's been postulated that you are actually a Transformer, and you are now uh, Optimus Brian. No, He's that would low. be our He's friend. That hot. would be our friend, Michael Michael T. Hike, Jr. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a question. What would happen if Brian got access to chlorine gas? No, that's not a question, Ann. The answer <laughs> is I get my book early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scrolling through. Uh, Dave Thomas asks if it's uh, time for fabrication. What? Are we going to fabricate some chlorine gas? Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's what Dave wants to know. That's uh, harkening back to the uh, to the uh, the cart driven by a horse. Can you recall that? I do. Dave does. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. While we're waiting for questions, um, you can you can. T oh wait, here's an actual question. Yep. Autopilot. You don't get to tell the the the, the rocket driven horse story tonight, Cooper. <laughs> Question from Otter Poet: Which version of the woods are dark 
do you prefer? Uh, for me, it, it's absolutely the author's preferred version, the Cemetery Dance Edition. <laughs> Anyone else? Wiley, what do you I've think? Read. I'm gonna go with author's preferred edition. Yeah, yeah always. Yeah, I, I, Jans, are you gonna? I'm the loser who hasn't read it. I didn't. You haven't read it, read it okay. until today. Okay. But uh, you read you read the headline edition though. I did. And, okay. And okay. Really because the headline edition and the U.S. edition are they're different books. Is that right? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah the uh, the read... edits and everything that Layman didn't like were, you know, was in the U.S. edition. You know, it, it, the headline edition, that is the one, when I first read The the Woods Are Dark, the U.S. edition, I'm like, what the, you know, I can't follow this. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was, it was difficult. It really the was. headline edition was much easier to read. Okay. Um, so they're, they're really I haven't read the author's preferred edition, so I'm going to have to say the headline. I think it's going to be you and me with the headline because, okay, you know, so I prefer that to the uh to the the die cut cover green freaking thing that we had hit so there are three distinct versions we're talking about at least wow but the headline edition is very close to the cemetery dance edition there's still some stuff that got cut that makes it into the cemetery dance edition uh but the the headline edition dick didn't have as much of a problem with that makes me feel so much better because I'm like, yeah, I know you're the worst good. taste in the world because it all made sense to me. Right. And that's because it was a better version than that. So, so the original one, the one, the US version, really must have been a train wreck. Oh, it right. was. Yeah, that's putting it. It was, it was jacked up. It was I mean, Jonathan, you, you and I have talked off the air without everyone else listening about what I went through with, with Random House and Terminal. Mm -hmm. Um, Take all of that and times it by oomph. And Coop will tell you, I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know if oomph is a real mathematical <laughs> equation. But that's what Dick Lehman went through with the woods are dark. Wow. Oomph oh. is actually wow. 4.7 oogs. That's bad. That's bad. If it's worse yeah. than if it's worse than the terminal situation, then it's bad. All right, we got a bunch of questions and. Yeah, uh, the, the viewers have decided it's just going to be questions about anything. So let's go to Alex Norcross. He has a question for Wiley Young. Your cow author, <laughs> Stephen <laughs> has been talking smack about you through the ads on the Ghost Rider podcast. Do you have a response? Well, from now on, I'll refer to him as cow author only. But... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my distinguished cow author, he uh, gave this ad, and uh, when Clicker, the Clicker's reboot comes out, I've prepared a manifesto for him in return. <laughs> Excellent. Is that what he another, another question for Wiley Young. Uh, Uptown Horror Reviews. Hey, good to see you here on the stream. I figured you would be playing Fallout 76 tonight. Uh, nice to know I'm not the only one not playing Fallout 76 tonight. Are we getting a sequel or spinoff to Magpie Coffin? Yes. Uh, for a few souls more, uh, tentatively coming out in 2021 later in the year. That will be the direct sequel to it. And uh, if that turns out well, there will be a third book which will end that story. Cool. Cool. All right. A layman question. Steve Clark. Asks, I only read the Traveling Vampire Show. What's the recommended next layman book to read? That is a great question. What are you holding up? Island? Island. West? Island. Okay, West that's Southern my, that, Island. That's my absolute favorite. The Cellar or One Rainy Night. Okay, you or say one The one Cellar or One Rainy Night. Coop, yeah. you're nodding in agreement with that? No, I'm, I'm, grant I'm granting that is absolutely valid. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I actually want to hear what uh, Christine was going to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Island or One Rainy Night as well. Those are my favorites. Yeah. I would say probably The Cellar. Um, that gets you into the into the beginning of the whole Beast House bit. Yeah. You know, and that's always fun. You know, and then you have, you know, many that 
you know, fall back from that. So that would be that would be a good spot for me, I would say. Jans, what about you? Those are all uh, great, uh, great options. Uh, Night in the Lonesome October is one. I don't know if I've heard anybody mention. Um, I think that was right around the same time that Traveling Vampire Show mm -hmm. was published. Yep. Okay, and I, I got a, I got. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's it's cool. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, it's it's a little more moody and atmospheric, um, and maybe because it's later in his career, um, you have a little more of that than you do in his earlier works. I've got to make a confession. I've read a ton of Layman, but two I've not read. And Coop, you're going to dis you're just meeting me here. This is the first time we've ever like, I've yeah. heard about you a billion times, but I've never actually like interacted with you. And <laughs> what a time to interact with you for the first time. But uh, you're going you're to disavow me um, right after meeting me, but I've not read uh, Savage. And I've not read uh, Traveling Vampire Show. I have them both, but I've not read either one of them. I've no, read I mean, you know, you know, great. I'm actually, I'm actually kind of jealous, you know, because those and are both great books, book. and then you get to read them for the first time. I yeah. can't do that again. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, forward. so that's cool, man. No, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's cool. I ain't gonna disavow now. No. <laughs> I'm gonna but, go with um, the... you know uh, one of them. One of them that I I don't think that I've heard gotten any love on the stream at all was Beware. Great oh, oh man, I love beware. Love it. Yeah, love that, that, beware. that was that was pretty freaking brutal. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so Steve, you know, it depends on what you're at, but you know, all these are you know good recommendations. Yeah. I mean, Steve, you know, I know you read my stuff, so you've probably read Castaways. So you know, the Cellar and the whole Beast House series is obviously a great choice. Uh, beware. Props to you. I'll admit, yes, Coop is right. Hmm. Um, Record I, that shit. <laughs> I'm going to say gonna be, That's your ringtone. Yeah. Funland. Right? Uh, Funland does not get enough love. Funland. I love Funland. I love, well, that's another one where I think the setting plays a major, major role. Yep. I mean, it, it's a character in the book. I love, yep. I love Funland. And if you if you read a writer's tale, uh, Funland, much like Quake, was again it was it was based on a real life occurrence, really uh, that he just took and ran with. Uh, all right, question from Ann Marble. Wait, did everybody get to answer Steve's question? Yes, right. I I should point out the two bar bourbon bottle is now empty. Um, so. Coop is. In here we go. That tasty makes <laughs> question. Which should I read first? I just bought Endless Night, No Sanctuary, Blood Game, Come Out Tonight, To Wake the Dead, Flesh, and Beware. I'm going to say Beware or Flesh. Yeah, same. Uh, of those, I would say probably Flesh. Beware or To Wake the Dead. Hmm. Yeah, Flesh. Yeah, beware. All right. Jans, Josh Malaman wants to do a book club with you. He wants to read Savage. <laughs> Done. Done. We start tonight. <laughs> I thought I was the only one who hadn't read that. Thank you for saving me, Josh. I haven't read Savage either. Uh, I, have, I actually haven't either. <laughs> oh, 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 guys. No, read that. I would be very, very interested to hear, you know, all of your thoughts on that. Nice. I really would. Truly. Dave Thomas, bourbon bottle empty equals here cone. Some amazing ideas. It's the internet. We speak typo. Stop picking on Dave. We only pick on you. <laughs> Learn the rules. No, we picked on Alex Norcross for his cow rider earlier. <laughs> but that's sticking, though. Oh, um, well, yeah. But speaking of Dave, I will say, uh, after you read Savage, right here on my YouTube page, go through... Uh, the Horror Show with Brian Keene archives and pull up the the book club episode where Mary and Dave and myself and I can't remember if Matt wasn't was on at that time yet or not. Matt, I, if you're in the uh, chat, still so. correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you were, but I don't we think you was. Did I lock up again? No, you're there. Oh, I'm sorry, Wes was making a constipated face. <laughs> 
So, so Wes. <laughs> All right. So is that it for tonight? Uh, Alex says the only layman I've read has come out tonight. I loved it. I wonder how it stacked up against his other works. Um, I, I'm a big fan of come out tonight. Uh, it's not one that gets a lot of love from layman hardcore fans, and I'm not sure why that is. Anyone have any thoughts? I don't remember it well. I remember reading it years ago, but I, I don't. Rem I remember the general premise of it, but I don't remember the book itself too well. It's one of the ones to, to Christine's point earlier. It, it's it's one of the ones where it, it, it's very much a female centric, strong female protagonist. Um, and, you know, and that's that's something we should acknowledge. Um, sure. Dick's stuff has a sophomore extent, particularly like Island, for example. Uh, but there was nobody more important in his life than Anne and Kelly Lehman. Um, so, you know, for those on the internet who like to decry him as a misogynist and this and that, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Period, point blank. End of story. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Nomers had to come and see what was going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kid, kid. That's a beautiful cat. Brian, I like come out tonight too. Um yeah. it's funny. One of my one of my best friends, one of my best reader friends, he I would I was, I was looking at the U Goodreads earlier for, for Layman and he like posted a one star that it's awful and I hate it and anybody who likes it has terrible taste. <laughs> and you find a lot of those with layman's books, don't you? You find a lot of you do very judgy of others who like, but I when I read it, I really enjoyed it. So I don't know if there's something wrong with me or not, but I'm I'm with you. I thought that but, was dude, that's that's why I love you. And I, you know, you and I have talked so many times off the air. I, I love you because you're other than Coop, you're one of the few people I know. You know, JF Gonzalez is dead. Dr. Gorilla is dead. So other than Coop, you're one of the uh -oh. people I know who's as wide read I am. And I love to sit with you and talk about, you know, random. I mean, they're night and day difference, but they're all part of the horror genre. And that's right. why that's that's why I love you. I love you too, brother. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, I think, oh, wait, we, I do see another comment popping up here. Uh, for the ones that knew Dick, what were his favorites? You know, that's a great question. And I'm sure it's in a writer's tale, but it's been about two years since I've read a reread a writer's tale. So I'm not sure. Coop, you vamp. While I while I quickly torch the table, <laughs> I want to see this man. <laughs> oh, suddenly he's quiet. <laughs> well, he he is muted though. He says he has a train coming. Well, then let us hear the train. <laughs> <laughs> they both sound about the same. I know. I, I just want to say that. Um, Damn you, oh, because no. I've still got like 68 books in my review file, but now I want to reread all my layman's. And so I'm I'm blaming you guys for that. Yeah, I'm starting to if, feel that. If my now. reviews get pushed back even further, it's your fault. <laughs> I'm just glad I didn't pack up my Beast House trilogy. We're in the middle of moving, so those are going to be my next layman reads. All right, we're going to end it with this. From Mordecai, uh, from a writer's tale, Rick Raymond's top 10 favorite short stories novellas. None of them were by him, um, but these are favorite, okay? Should I do 10 to number one or number one to 10? Start with 10. Yeah. Start with 10? Okay. Number 10. Lamb to the Slaughter by Roald Dahl. Number nine, Iverson's Pits by Dan Simmons. Number eight, The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. Number seven, The Dumbwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. Number six, The Deep End by Robert R. McCammon. Number five, 
The Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. Number four, A Clean, Well-Lighted Place by Ernest Hemingway. Number three, The Body Steve, by Stephen King. Hey, Casey Kasem, coming in here with you with the top ten. Coming in at number two. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. The Black Cat <laughs> by Edgar Allan Poe. And the number one favorite by Richard Lehman, The Big Two-Hearted River by Ernest Hemingway. So there you go. There's some more reads to add to your pile. Uh, Bill Kuntz or Bullet Kuntz asks, is that a Dan Simmons novel? No, that is a short story. Um, I have the anthology in there in my library. I can't remember what the hell it's called. I think it's the Skin Trade. I think that's that's published in the Skin Trade, which was also uh, one of the Night Visions volumes, but I don't remember which volume. Coop, do you know? No? Okay. All right. But yes, it's a it's a novella, short story, novelette, I think is the, the actual official term. Uh, it's Iverson's Pits, and that's set in Gettysburg, uh, Devil's Den. It's a it's a Civil War horror story, and, and yeah, it, it's badass. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I got, I got everybody one thing. Tuned in, and everybody who will be watching this, of course, in perpetuity on YouTube. I want to give my guests each a chance to plug uh, where you can find them, what they have available. Let's just start at the top. Wiley Young, starting with you. Well, I've got my newest novel, Magpie Coffin, and my other new release this year, The Perfectly Fine House, written with my cow author, Stephen Kozniewski. Both of them are available online at uh, Amazon. You buy there, and you can always interact with me on Facebook. Facebook, just look, look up the author that looks like a that named himself after Looney Tune, and you'll find me. And and I have to ask, and I hate to hold the others up, but you know, JF Gonzalez and Mark Williams, they created the Clickers mythos, this intellectual property, and I unwisely, some would say, <laughs> handed it to you and Stephen Kosnus with the estate's blessing. I just like it. To add, what's the status on that? What what's what's the status on Clickers rebooting? We are down to the last three chapters, and then the first draft will be done. All right, nice. All right, which is all ball in my court at this point. Cause finished his like a week ago. That terrifies me for reasons I can't articulate. <laughs> Christine Morgan, how about you? <laughs> Well, I can be found on Facebook, of course, and on WordPress at christinemariemorgan.wordpress.com. Got all my books there and a bunch of reviews and stuff. Um, I've got, let's see, of course, Lake House Infernal. I still can't believe that it won that award. <laughs> And I also have a Splatter Western, The Night Silver River Run Red, which was a lot of fun. Um, I should have, oh, wow, he's got it right there. Look at that. It's my next read. It's excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Um, I should have a new Viking collection coming in 2021, as well as a few other projects. And may I say that my 12-year-old loves your Viking stuff. Oh, I knew it. He's the perfect age for it, too. Well, I hope he likes the new one because it was also a lot of fun. And, of course, cats. <laughs> Good day. Well, Southern, how about you? Um, before I plug anything, um, I figured maybe we could say a couple of nice things about a couple of other layman disciples that we haven't spoken of tonight. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Well, because we all know that layman was very, very popular in the UK, but he was also very, very popular in Australia. And there are two particular Australian authors that were very, very heavily influenced by him that if you haven't read these guys, I really think you guys should check them out. Now, I don't know – I don't see them much online anymore, so I don't know how much they're actually writing these days, but I'm sure their stuff is still in print, and if you can find it, you absolutely should. One of them is Brett McBean. Mm -hmm. Brett McBean is a fantastic writer, and uh, this is one of his books from the uh, – 
Concrete Jungle trilogy. I thought it was fantastic. Yep. And another one, and I know Kane's going to agree, this book was fucking incredible. Love Lies Dying by Steve Gerlach. Uh, this Gerlach, book reads... Gerlach, this book is, reads, Gerlach is good. Oh. Yeah, th this book is phenomenal, and it reads like a lost layman book. It's so good. I mean, this yep. book is literally the epitome of cock tease. Like, this book is a giant yep. cock tease book. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so good. It is so 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 good. Uh, all of Gerlach's stuff is fantastic, by the way. So yeah, yeah I figured I need. I feel I needed to. I needed to mention them for sure. No, I said, those no, guys. I'm so glad you did. I I yeah. Really, when I literally woke up this morning and decided to do this live stream tonight, um, and and I throughout the day while I was contacting each of you, I thought, man, I'd really like to get Gerlach and McBean on, but like you said, they're they're just they're not. Yeah. Around anymore. Um, but absolutely, if you're a layman fan, read either one of them, and it, it's like you're reading a lost layman novel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gerlach actually used to run the, the unofficial layman website, Richard Layman yep. Kill. Yep, yep, um, yep. God, that was a long time ago. Um, yep. as far as I, I'm I'm online, you just Google me. I got a website, wesleysouther.com, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. It's all the same. Uh Got Cruel Summer, my new novel coming out on January fifteenth. Um, I have a new novella that I co-wrote with Mark Steensland that'll be out on uh, in May of twenty twenty one. Don't have a date in May, but it is May. And then just working on their stuff. I gotta I gotta start writing that uh, primitive sequel next year, so that's on the docket and. Working on a a, a Fulci book with uh, Lucas Mangum right now, so that's that's a lot of fun. But yep, yeah, just staying busy. Cool. Yeah, I All think right, I filled so, up again. Uh, you there? No, you're still there, B. Yeah. Yeah, you're there. Oh. All right. So, uh, somebody was asking. Okay, so there was a good there was a question on there. Uh, it's kind of well timed. So I've got a lot coming, um, but things are kind of in flux. We we need to talk, Brian. Uh, a lot of things are kind of up in the air right now. So uh, I've got a lot coming. I've got a lot in the pipeline. Um, one of them I know is going to be coming from Cemetery Dance relatively soon, um, but I'm not sure exactly when that's coming. Um, and then there's a lot more after that. I know when it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Uh, <laughs> um, you can find me on anywhere online, uh, you know, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, uh, Facebook, a little less, but I'm there sometimes. So you can find me there, uh, find my books wherever. And then some of the books that I would recommend of my own work, uh, if you're a layman fan, the closest probably I ever came to layman was Savage Species, um, which was, I don't know. I'm not saying it's it's exactly like layman, but it probably has the most laymonian flavor of any of my books. And then the ones I would recommend just aside from layman influence would be The Raven is my new one. And then I have uh, The Siren and the Spectre, Children of the Dark, and The Dark Game are all relatively new. And then Exorcist Falls is relatively new as well, last few years. So there we go. That's enough. Enough recommendations. We can go to Coop. And, and, and before we go to Coop, <laughs> yes, we do need to talk because I, I have thoughts and I have ideas and I have a game plan for you. For the next five years. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Coop, do it. Do folks it. are about to click out of this live stream. Yeah, this is probably only, time to introduce me. <laughs> if only there was another place on YouTube they could go with, yeah, without yeah. leaving the website. Yeah. Where would that be? Well, you could just uh, search in uh, Jeff Cooper, just spell it weird on YouTube, and then you know look for something like the graphic behind me over here, and then click on that. Uh, there, um, on my uh, YouTube, I primarily take on, you know, the question of religion, uh, faith, and, you know, reasons to believe things. And uh, occasionally, I, you know, very, very occasionally, I'll get into uh, current events topics, but it has to be something that really, really interests me. Uh, the last time that something did... It was the New York Post kind of pissed me off with that whole thing where they outed that uh, that 23 year old medic because she had an OnlyFans and they, you know, cost her both their jobs. And um, 
yeah, you don't you don't do that to one of my sisters in EMS. Fuck you. So uh, that's where you can find me. You can also find me on Twitter at bchvids, and you know that that's it. You know, I uh, most of my writing anymore. I have I do have a writing project that I'm working on, um, not fiction, and you know it, it's more in line with the content of the YouTube channel. And, you know, that's, you know, there isn't any contract signed or anything like that. There is a, uh, you know, so I'm not going to go, you know, talking about publishers or dates or, you know, any content like that, but, you know, it will be more on the same type of thing. All right. Well, gang, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Richard Lane lives. Merry Christmas to you all. Happy holidays to you all. If you don't celebrate Christmas, Rump, Rump, I'm going to make two announcements right now. Uh, number one, uh, we will see you in 2021 with David J. Scow as our first guest. And announcement number one is Coop. I'm I'm tapping you as co-host for that episode. All right, awesome, Drake. Yeah, yeah um, that. get in touch with me. Right. You, you know how to get in touch with me. Let me know. You know, yeah, I, I will be kind of more than happy to hang out with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I will be more than happy to hang out with Dave. And uh, announcement number two, as I said, after Dave, uh, we're gonna have Tim Wagoner, Cynthia Paleo, Gabino Iglesias, but Josh Malaman, uh, you are you are one of the folks that I always wanted to get on the horror show with Brian Keen, and we just never had a chance to make it happen. Uh I'm challenging you right now. I want you to come on the Keen stream. I won't have Coop that night, I promise you. We'll, we'll take it easy. <laughs> but but I, I, I want to sit down. Josh is is one of my favorite people in this business, and I, I want a good two hours to just sit down and talk to him about his his love of horror. Um, Jonathan, he reminds me of you a lot, actually. Bo both of you are just so well-read. Well, thank you. And, uh, that's you know, that, that hits me right here. So Josh, anyway, everybody, amazing. happy holidays, and we will see yeah. you in 2021. Yeah, happy holidays, everybody. Happy Stay holidays, safe, everybody. Stay, Stay healthy. Safe. All right, we'll see you. Bless you.